Good morning again, church family. It is good to be with you and worship with you this Lord's Day. Uh, I pray that as this coronavirus situation uh, continues on, that uh, God is uh, assisting and enabling you to persevere with patience, uh, with temperance, and hopeful expectation of being able to gather again in person soon. Uh, I, like you, can't wait until we can meet together that way and to do so safely and in a healthy way. You probably saw this week that the governor of New Mexico is extending the executive order, or intending to anyway, uh, uh, to stay at home until May 15th. And so that means that we won't uh, very likely be able to meet together as a church on campus uh, here at our facility uh, until after May 15th. Uh, we are working and hoping to finalize soon uh, a plan for reopening and being able to meet back here at the church. And so keep an eye out for that. Check your email from the church and pay attention to us uh, on social email and uh, social uh, media, excuse me, and other venues to stay up to date uh, on how we are responding as a church to the coronavirus situation. I want to thank those of you who have participated over the last week in sharing your story about how Jesus changed your life on Facebook uh, and other places on social media. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to do it this week. Let's make much of this opportunity to highlight the saving work of Christ that he has done and completed for us, his followers, uh, by flooding social media with the hope of the gospel. So if you haven't recorded a short version of your testimony and posted it to social media with the hashtag Jesus Changed My Life and tagged uh, uh, our church at FBC West ABQ, uh, I encourage you to do that this week. Take to social media, share how Jesus has changed your life, share the hope of the gospel with those who know you and see how you interact on uh, on Facebook, on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and those sorts of things. As we prepare to worship this morning, I would invite you to just now to bow with me, bow your heads, bow your hearts, uh, whatever you may need to do that. Maybe you need to stand in prayer in your living room this morning. Maybe you need to kneel at the couch or at your bedside. Maybe you need to fall on your face before God this morning, uh, leaning upon His grace and His help in all things. Whatever posture you feel you need to take this morning in prayer, I pray that ask that you would do that and join with me as we pray together. Our God in heaven, we praise you for the fact that you are the author of life and the source of our life day to day. And though we live in the present reality of serious illness and even death, that these forces do not have the final word or greatest authority, we rejoice that in the hope that we have of life everlasting by faith in Jesus, that sin and death have been robbed of their sting in the wonderful work of Christ, our risen Savior. Lord, we confess that in this week and time of quarantine that we have slipped into indulging the flesh. We have acted angrily. We have been tempted to be greedy and self-centered. We've been impatient with others and at times disrespectful of those in authority over us. Forgive us of these sins, we pray and bring our affections and our will into conformity to yours. Give us strength for repenting with the promise of your Spirit to guide and sanctify us in truth. As pastors and churches look forward to the day when we'll be free to safely gather again, we ask for your help and for your patience to endure until that time. I pray for our brothers and sisters at Iglesia Bautista Rosa de Saron in Santa Fe, and for their pastor Raul Velasquez. And we pray for Canyon Bible Church and for their pastor, Bill Butler. I ask that by your grace, Lord, you would sustain them as they are separate and that you would edify them as they are dispersed and deployed as your witnesses and makers of disciples in the world. Be gracious to our church body as well, Lord. Calm our fears and soothe our anxieties. Remind us of that which you have commissioned all of us as your people to do to make disciples of all nations. And to that end, we pray again for our friends and family who are without a relationship with you and with whom we long to share the hope of the gospel. This morning, we pray specifically for our brother Zeke and for his friend Kyle. We ask that you would give opportunity and boldness to Zeke to speak words of life and hope in Christ to his friend. And we pray that Kyle would be enabled by your spirit to hear the gospel clearly and to respond to the truth of Christ in faith. God, be greater than our feeble words and, and move more mightily than our human attempts. Glorify yourself in the proclamation of the gospel and the faith of those who believe. Today, Lord, I pray for those in our church 
who are suddenly in the throes of financial insecurity because of this pandemic. I pray first that you would remind them of your loving care for all your children and for your perfect and of your perfect provision in their time of need. I pray second that you would lead us as their brothers and sisters to lead with generous hearts and open hands to meet their needs during this time. May the world know that we are your disciples, Lord Jesus, by the love that we have for one another. Now, Father, I pray that you would be great among us. Be glorified in our worship and magnified in our hearts. Lord Jesus, increase in us today as we look to you. May we decrease in every way so that you would be exalted in our church, in the church body of First Baptist West Albuquerque. Holy Spirit, enable us with obedience to Christ and love for the Father in all that we say and do. We ask this in the name of the risen Lord Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Good morning. Hear the word of the Lord this morning as we enter into this time of worship through song. We're going to be reading from 2 Peter in chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. But do, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a, a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that you should perish but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let us be reminded this morning that God is not like us. He's not bound by space or time. God is always at work. He is at patient. He is patient, desiring all to come to him. As we sing the unchanging truth of the gospel this morning, as we conclude our time in the narrative of scripture, the biblical account of Jesus and his last days, fulfilling his purpose here on earth, I just pray that we would be reminded of the calling on each of us to live lives of holiness and godliness. And the work that he has commissioned us to do between now and the time that we do are called home, be disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men like Example is He. The Word became flesh and the light shined among us. His glory revealed. Living He loved me. Dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified. Just hide freely forever. 
day, oh glorious day. One day the grave. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the storm rolled away from the door. Then he arose, or oh, death he had conquered. Now he's ascended, Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him. far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day glorious day sing oh praise the name that you would bow your heads this morning as we continue in our time of worship today. And that last phrase that we just sang really captured my attention this week. That word transfixed. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. There, there's no words to describe that when that takes place, for those that know Christ, that are following Him. My good friend Tim, this week we were talking about that and just to hear it through his perspective and, and through his eyes, Tim is not seeing on this earth, but to, when the first time that he sees, he'll see the face of Jesus. I was just, I was just blown away by that this week. And just what that's going to be like. Would you just spend a few moments this morning just praising God however that you are led this morning in doing that. Let's just spend a few moments this morning.
blessed. That's My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that together again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing Christ alone. Christ alone. seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Sing my anchor. My Join me, would you, in your copy of God's Word in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Uh, we are wrapping up today this series uh, the, uh, of weeks that we have spent together in the Gospel of Luke, the, the story that Luke is telling of the life of Jesus, uh, specifically looking at the last few chapters of Luke's Gospel, at Jesus the King, the Messiah, who enters into Jerusalem, riding on the colt of a donkey, uh, being declared as the Christ by his disciples, the King who is crucified for sins and raised in glory, who in his glorified body appears to his disciples, proving his divinity and his power over sin and death, and who, as we'll see at the end of Luke's Gospel and the beginning, of Luke's history of the church, of the work of the disciples in Acts, of Jesus the King who is returning for his people. 
it is interesting how at different stages in uh, our human life that, that we respond to people going away with the promise of coming back again. As infants, when uh, our parents left the room, we, we likely screamed and cried because uh, if they were not within sight, they ceased to exist in, in our, our, our pitiful little, little minds. And when they returned, we were filled with elation and, and joy. I think about my daughters who are in elementary school and when they have substitute teachers for a day because their teacher has gone away and there's a substitute. When they know that a substitute is going to be there, uh, very often the whole class will just kind of, they go nuts. It's, 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 it's no rules day uh, at, at school. But they know that if they act up too much, when their teacher comes back, when their teacher returns, uh, there's going to be stuff to, to deal with and, and business to be taken care of. Uh, even as I've been married for several years now, uh, I think about, you know, as my wife and I leave each other for the day to, to, to go to work or whatever the case may be. And, you know, we kiss each other goodbye and say, have a good day and all of that sort of thing. And, and we do so without freaking out like an infant. And, and we also do so without the, the, the sort of anarchical uh, impulse that many, maybe children have when the authority figures are, are, are away. But we leave each other with hope and excitement of seeing each other again at the end of the day and sharing what happened throughout the course of the day. And conversations that we had and those sorts of things. I think of uh, even how we deal with people going away as we get uh, older in life. Uh, after we spend many decades on earth, it's, it's not a, an uncommon thing for people to go away for a period of time and come back, for family members to maybe move states away or maybe even over an ocean and knowing that we won't see them maybe for some time. But uh, over life uh, and experience, we we, we don't become disheartened or, uh, or quite as distressed when people go away because we get used to folks going away and coming back. And so it's more like a see you later than it is goodbye. Well, imagine, if you will, put yourself in the, the place of the disciples who in the last 40 days or so of, uh, uh, of their time with Jesus as he's been risen from the dead, uh, they have been sort of preparing for him to go away. Now, at the beginning of Acts chapter 1, Jesus leaves. In fact, we read a summary statement of his leaving the disciples at the end of Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 24, verses 50 to 53, we read this. And Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. That's a very summary way of speaking about Jesus leaving his disciples. And Luke does a, a, a helpful job for us in his second volume of the history of Jesus and the disciples in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, where there we get a more detailed look of what Jesus said to his disciples and how he responded to them and the promise of his return that was given there as he ascended to heaven. Will you turn your attention to God's word and read with us, read along with us, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, what an amazing uh, passage of scripture, yet again, as we have these details, uh, this story told, narrated to us by Luke, about how Jesus left his disciples with the promise of return. At this point, having proved his lordship, his kingship, uh, by his death and resurrection, now Christ, before he leaves, commissions his disciples to be kingdom emissaries, kingdom witnesses, until his certain return. 
the point of this, uh, of this passage of Scripture that I want for us to, to glean together this morning is this. The King is coming. The King is returning. So let us make full the kingdom. Let us make ready the kingdom for His return. As we study this passage, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, I hope that we would be heartened, that we would be encouraged by the hope of Christ's return to make disciples, to live with confidence and faith in Christ, and to be of good cheer as we await His coming. So what do we learn about Jesus as the returning King from these uh, these verses. And, and what do we learn about his return, how he'll return, what he's returning for, what kind of king he'll return as? Well, first we learn from verses 6 and 7 that Jesus is a different kind of king. Jesus is a different kind of king. See, as he appears to his disciples this last time before he departs from them, they come to him in verse 6 wanting to know if as the Messiah, as the king that God has promised, he is going to return Israel to their place of prominence and priority among the nations of the world. Now, this was an expectation that had been sort of built up and alluded to by some of the Old Testament prophets, specifically Micah in Micah chapter 4 and Joel in Joel 2 and 3. Both of those prophets seem to be associating the coming of the Messiah with the restoration uh, of, of Israel as an, a nation among the world, as God's people and representative people in the world. So likewise, the disciples apparently saw no reason, now that Christ has been raised from the dead, raised in glory, why, why he could not immediately inaugurate his earthly messianic kingdom right then and there, on that mount in, in Bethany, on the Mount of Olives there. Uh, why, Jesus, do you not just do what we thought the Messiah was going to do? Jesus responds to their question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? By saying essentially to them, listen guys, that's not really your concern. That, that's not the thing you should be most worried or most concerned about right now. Now Jesus is not saying that he's not king, nor is he saying that he's not going to bring a, a kingdom, or that he's not going to complete his kingdom. Surely he will do that. But what Jesus is saying to the disciples in verse 7, as he says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. What he is saying is essentially that he comes to establish a kingdom that is far different from what the disciples expected. His kingdom is primarily a spiritual one. It's a heavenly kingdom. That does not mean that it doesn't have physical ramifications and physical realities, but, but even that as a spiritual kingdom, as a heavenly kingdom, uh, it is a, a kingdom that's more real even than our physical world. His kingdom is one that exists not in the uh, boundaries of, uh, of political borders and national borders. His kingdom is one that exists in the hearts of those who love him. Jesus is a divine king. As the eternal son of God and the Messiah, he is a divine king who rules over heaven and earth and not on earth only. And so you see the question that the disciples were asking was not the wrong question. It was just kind of pointed in the wrong direction. In this way, Jesus proves that he is a different kind of king than his disciples had been expecting and even after his resurrection thought that he would be. And he's a different kind of king entirely from every earthly kingdom in the world. He's a different kind of king because his kingdom is a different kind of kingdom. Jesus is a different sort of king. And secondly, he's the king of a global kingdom. We said just before, the kingdom that Jesus comes to bring is not one that is bound by national borders, but finds its home in the hearts of all who are united to him by faith. Jesus is a king of a global kingdom, not, not a geopolitical kingdom. Verse 8 leads us to understand this. In verse 8, Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. This verse actually goes a long way to answering the disciples' question about the establishment of Jesus' kingdom. Well, they're concerned with Jesus taking the throne and taking over, but he turns their attention to the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God, as their power for being witnesses of him in all the earth, beginning in Jerusalem, 
right? The capital city of God's people, Israel, but extending far beyond that, even to the ends of the earth. In the Gospel of Luke, and in his sister volume to that history of Jesus and the church, the book of Acts that we're looking at this morning, these concepts of the Messiah and the kingdom of God are virtually inseparable. You can't talk about the expectation of the Messiah, the expectation uh, and the coming of the Christ without talking about God's kingdom. And likewise, you can't talk about God's kingdom without, without calling to the attention of those that you're speaking to uh, the concept of the Messiah and the king. Whoever the king is, there is the kingdom. And so Messiah and kingdom, king and kingship all go together in Luke and Acts. And in verse 8, the king, Jesus, is giving orders to his citizens, to the disciples, to be global representatives of the king, to be emissaries, to be ambassadors, to be those who speak on behalf of the king to all the world. And what they speak to the world, their proclamation to the world, consists of this. It consists of the good news of the kingdom. That, that is that the Messiah has come. That he has stood in the place of judgment for his people. That he has raised his life from the grave to give life to all who repent of sin and trust in him as king. The king has come and he's bringing his kingdom. And it is so much better and so much bigger and so much greater than just the people of Israel. It is a kingdom that will extend to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In another of the Old Testament prophets, Hosea, chapter 1, verse 10, we read these words. God says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. This innumerable multitude who are the children of God in Hosea chapter 1 sounds to me so much like this innumerable multitude that we see mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 and 10. There in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, the Apostle John receives this glorious vision of the risen Lord Jesus, uh, and he sees the unfolding of events that are yet to come before the end. And in Revelation chapter, nine, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, we read these words. After this I looked, says John, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, it seems that what Jesus is commanding his disciples to do in Acts 1 verse 8 is to establish his global kingdom through the proclamation of the gospel. And not only to national Israel, but to all the nations of the earth, so that those who were previously outside of God's covenant community of Israel might now enter into God's global covenant people through the reception of Jesus as Messiah. His kingdom is global and heavenly. It is spiritual. Christ's kingdom is not and cannot be limited to physical borders and ethnic groups. His kingdom is a global kingdom that, that goes far beyond all of these other limitations. But third, we learn from Jesus uh, about the king that he is in verses 6 through 11 of Acts 1, that Jesus is the king who, though he has gone away, is returning to complete his kingdom. Jesus is returning to complete his kingdom. Look, at, look with me at verses 9 through 11. When Jesus had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go, go into heaven. No sooner does Jesus give these royal marching orders to his disciples to be witnesses of him in all the earth, than does he ascend to heaven. He disappears from their sight, uh, uh, going to be at the right hand of the Father in glory. The ascension of Jesus has been a firmly believed uh, and central part of the Christian faith from this moment that, that Luke is recording for us here in Acts. You know, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, writing even before likely Luke wrote his gospel or Acts, Paul says these words to his young disciple in the faith, 
He says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness, that he, Christ, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So this idea that, that Jesus has ascended to heaven to be at the right hand of God until he returns again, this is not a new thing. It's not a, it's not a late invention, uh, a, a detail added long after the events of Jesus' life to somehow give hope to those people who had been waiting for a long time for him to return. No, Jesus' ascension and promised return were something that the, the church held on to tightly as a core tenet of their belief from its earliest days. Yeah, as Jesus ascends, we have here in uh, verse 10 this really sort of funny moment with the disciples, you know, staring, gazing into the sky, like almost dumbfounded. You see them maybe, maybe even with their, their mouths open like catfish, just, you know, gawking into the clouds. And in uh, verse 10, these two angels appear among them, men in white robes appear among them to say essentially to them, hey guys, uh, quit staring at the sky, right? Pick your jaws up off the floor. Just as Jesus went into heaven, he will also come back. That's a promise. And it's almost as if the, the angels are saying this to the disciples to, uh, to press, to urge them to be obedient to what Christ had told them to do, to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. It's like, guys, uh, okay, I know that what you just saw was, uh, was, was, was dumbfounding, was fascinating, was amazing and glorious, but uh, Jesus gave you some things to do. He gave you work to do, so get about it. They do so with the promise that Christ will return. Jesus is the king who is returning to complete his kingdom. Just as surely as he ascended to heaven, so also will he just as surely return. But this causes us to ask all sorts of questions, particularly as we wait in the meantime for Christ to return. But I think the, the most important question that Christ's ascension and the promise of his return uh, causes us to ask is this, why? Why must Christ return? Well, how is it not simply enough? How does it not complete God's plan or God's intention that Jesus just simply die for sins, be raised from the dead, and, send, and ascend to heaven? Why must he come back? Well, Christ must come back for at least three reasons that I can see in Scripture. The first is this. Christ must return because he promised that he would. Christ must return because he promised that he would. In Luke chapter 21, verse 27, Jesus says this uh, to those who are listening. He says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. These words are repeated in Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13 as Jesus is teaching about uh, the, the events before the end of the age, before he returns again. And he essentially promises that he will come back, that, that his return in glory is a certain fact. But also in John's gospel, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus speaks to the disciples this way. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that, that, that where I am, you may be also. Christ has promised that he would return. Christ has promised that, that he would come back in glory to gather his church, to, to bring his people to himself. He must return because he has promised that he would. And dear friend, if we can trust that all of the promises of God, that G, uh, 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 of God to send a Messiah, to send his servant, his king, who, who would live and die in the place of his people, be raised from the dead and pay for their sins, if we can believe all the promises of God in the Old Testament to that effect, and to believe that all of those promises are fulfilled in Jesus, then we can just as surely believe and with confidence, hold to the promise that Christ will return, because he himself said so. Secondly, Christ must return to judge the living and the dead. He must return to judge the living and the, de and the dead. Again, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 and 32, we read these words. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
When Christ returns, He returns as judge. He returns as one who separates those who have uh, placed genuine faith in Him, who have sincerely repented of sin and followed Him as Lord, from those who have rejected Him and, and, and continued on living uh, in rejection of the truth that Jesus is Messiah. As God in flesh, the only divine King, Jesus alone is able to judge with perfect certainty and, and perfect justice the hearts of men and women. Only He knows, dear friend, the truth of your heart, the, the, and whether your profession of faith in Him is genuine and sincere. Uh, only He knows whether some in the church are merely pretending to be Christians, whether some are, are seeking to grow in status or, or just to somehow soothe the, the brokenness of their hearts with religiosity rather than with faith in Him. Jesus alone knows the hearts of all men, and Jesus alone can judge the way that, that God can because He is God in flesh. He is the only divine King. He must return to judge the living and the dead. Third and finally, uh, Jesus must return to complete His kingdom by perfecting the salvation of believers. He must return to complete His kingdom, to perfect His kingdom by fulfilling the salvation of believers. The author of Hebrews in chapter 9, verses 27 to 28, writes these words, listen. He says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for Him. Jesus must return to complete His kingdom by perfecting the salvation of believers. It's kind of a funny way of speaking to say that Jesus is coming to perfect the salvation of believers. Like, isn't our salvation certain already because of His death and resurrection from the dead? Uh, aren't we certainly justified, made right with God by placing faith in Jesus as Lord? Isn't that a certainty? Isn't that a promise? Shouldn't we be assured of those realities by what we see in Scripture? Yes, absolutely. But even as we are certainly saved from sin by faith in Jesus, we are not, in this present moment, finally saved. There's a sense in which our salvation has yet to take on a greater reality. And that is, as we are raised from the dead with new and glorified bodies like that of Christ and ushered into His presence in the new heavens and the new earth forever, that is when our uh, salvation will be perfected. Jesus comes a second time not to deal with sin. He's already died for sins and been raised from the dead. He comes a second time to save to completion those who have eagerly waited for Him to return in faith and expectation of His coming. Jesus is a different kind of King who rules over a global kingdom that finds its home and its rule and reign and dominion in the hearts of all those who love Him and by faith have come to trust in Him. And Jesus is the King who is returning one day to complete His kingdom. So what? Well, what do all of these glorious realities, these, these important truths that we draw from Scripture, what do they have to do with your life and with mine as followers of Jesus? What, what should we do? How should we respond to the, the truth of who Jesus is as the returning King? Well, I think at least three things. First, be ready. Christ is coming. The first so what, the, the, the first application of these truths to our hearts is this. Be ready. Christ is returning. What does readiness for Christ's return, for the King's return, look like? Well, I think it primarily looks like active kingdom investment. Being ready for Christ's return looks like active kingdom investment. You know, in Luke chapter 19, before uh, He is crucified and before all the events of, uh, of Passion Week or Holy Week, Jesus tells a parable to his disciples about a nobleman who goes away for a period of time so that he might receive a kingdom, so that he might be made king of the land in which he dwells. And as he goes away, he, that nobleman gives to his servants various amounts of money, various bits of currency of the king's kingdom to do business with until he returns. And so when that king returns, having received his kingdom, he goes to settle accounts with his servants. The first two servants that he encounters have been faithful with what he has given to them. They have taken the bits of money, the talents that they have been given. 
and invested them doing business uh, in the king's place as he was gone. And each of them have doubled, effectively, the amount of money that they were given to invest. And for their faithfulness, they are rewarded and called to enter into the joy of their master. But then there's a third servant. A third servant who didn't put his, uh, what the king had given to him in the king's absence, he didn't put it to work. He didn't invest it. He, he, he didn't uh, uh, get busy with what the king had given him. Instead, he took that money, he hid it in a handkerchief and buried it in the ground. And when the king returns, that third servant gives simply back uh, to the king what was given to him. And because he has not done what the king ordered him to do, because he did not invest the king's currency in the king's absence, he is judged harshly and separated from that king's kingdom. So as Jesus goes away, and I think he tells this parable to his disciples to prepare them for the fact that he is going to go away and one day return, that he is going to ascend to the Father and one day return to, to, to bring his kingdom and his servants to account. What is it that Jesus has entrusted his servants with in his absence? What is the currency of the kingdom that Jesus leaves to his servants to invest, to do business with, to do work with while he is gone? Well, certainly it is not anything so small or, or as pithy as just money. It's just finances in this world. Certainly, the commission of the king to his disciples is to, is to do work with the gospel of the kingdom, right? To cause the good news that the king has come and that he's returning and that there is salvation uh, by faith in his name to invest that news, to invest that message with the world. In Matthew chapter 28, the very last verses of Matthew's gospel, we have Matthew recording what Jesus said to the disciples before he ascended. And there he says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I'm be with you. Uh, lo, I'm with you uh, even until the end of the age. Go make disciples. Disciples, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, Jesus says to his disciples in Acts. Certainly the commission of the king to his disciples to be witnesses and to make disciples of the king who will make disciples of the king who will make disciples of the king does not go on the back burner while the king is away. Rather, it rises to the forefront of our priority list as followers of Christ. It, it takes Place number one in our list of things to do until Christ returns to be his witnesses and to make his dis and to make disciples of him. That is what it means to be ready. Knowing that Christ, the king, because he's the king and he's returning with authority, knowing that he's returning, we must be ready by being active investors of the kingdom message, which is that there is salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. Sadly, sometimes, especially over the last century or so, we have substituted other things for kingdom readiness. Sometimes we substitute things like eschatological fascination for readiness for the king's return. Sometimes rather than spending our effort, spending our energy, working hard for Christ to make disciples of the king so that when he returns, we can present him with the investment of the kingdom message that, 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 we, have, um, that we have put to work in his absence. Instead, we spend our time and our energy in fascination over these little details that, that Jesus speaks about in Matthew 24 and 25 and, and in much of the figurative and, and illustrative uh, images that we see in Revelation, trying to figure out all the details of when he comes again. Sometimes, and to our shame, we spend more time and energy trying to anticipate the return of Jesus by, by reading the signs of the times and trying to figure out all of the details and all of the chronology of his return, more so than we do investing our time, our energy, our lives in in making active kingdom investment by making disciples of Jesus. Jesus didn't say, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make great charts and awesome infographics and timelines about what my return will be like. No, he said, go make disciples. There's more important things to do for us than to be fascinated, and sometimes morbidly so, with the details and chronology of Christ's return. More important than knowing 
what the number of the beast actually will be, and what the time of Christ's return will be, and exactly all the details of all of those things. More important than knowing all of that and having certainty about those very difficult to understand things is this, that we make disciples of Jesus Christ. Be ready. Christ the King is returning. And now, if you put the emphasis on the right syllable, you can take that uh, phrase, Christ is returning, and make it to mean something, uh, not make it mean, to mean something altogether different, but uh, bring a different sense of weight and application to our lives. So be ready. Christ, the King, is returning. But second, be certain, because Christ is returning. Be certain, be confident. Christ is returning. You know, in the course of human history, and by our own reckoning, it has been a good long while since Christ was ascended to the Father, and we have been waiting for His return. Some 2,000 years have nearly gone by since we have begun as the church to wait for Christ's return. That is a long time. Most of us will not be blessed enough to live a century to, to live over a hundred years, much less uh, certainly not to have lived 20 centuries to, uh, of waiting that long. For us, 80, 90 years is a really long life. It's a long time to wait for Christ's return. But we need to learn as Christians and, and as finite human beings who are depending upon God moment by moment, not to gauge slowness, not to gauge time or, or uh, long waiting periods, uh, differently from how uh, from how how God does, we we need to not judge them by our own reckoning, but by God's reckoning. As Pastor Danny read earlier, uh, as we began worshiping in song from Second Peter three verse nine, these words Peter encourages the church with. He says, "The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but He is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance." We have waited a long time for Christ's return, and we may wait longer still. But at the same time, if we are waiting, it is not because God is ungracious. It is not because God is toying with our emotions or our expectations. It's not because God is unfaithful. It is because He is patient. It is because He desires for the gospel to fill the earth. He wants men, women, and children from every tribe, nation, and tongue to hear the gospel, respond to it in faith, be saved for His glory, so that that picture of Revelation 7 will be complete, will be fulfilled, where there will be an innumerable multitude around the throne of God. For every tribe, nation, people, and tongue, every skin color and ethnic group and cultural background, praising God and saying salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. His patience notwithstanding, His, his return is imminent. Though we have waited a long time, and though Christ is, is waiting even in patience before He returns, His return is certain, and it will be uh, relatively speaking, and in the scope of eternity, soon and very soon. Christ is returning. So, dear friend, be certain of how you shall meet Him when He comes. Be certain of how you shall meet Him when He comes. Those of us who know Christ by faith, who have given our lives to Him to rule over as King, we will receive Him as the long-awaited and celebrated King, the one that we have eagerly waited for, as the author of Hebrews says. We will receive Him with joy and gladness and celebration and shouts of victory. But for those who do not know the King, for those who have rejected Him, for those who have despised His rightful and godly and gracious rule and reign over their lives and over every bit of creation. For them, he will not be received as the long-awaited celebrated king, but he'll be received as the enemy who is finally and perfectly and completely encroaching upon their own kingdom. He will not become as the one that we have been, uh, uh, as the one that has been waited for, but as the one who has been hoped against. Dear friend, Wherever you are and wherever you're watching this today, my encouragement to you is this. Be certain of Christ's return and be certain of how you will meet him when he comes. My, my prayer for you and, and, and the promise of the gospel, the hope of the gospel for every person is that we can all greet him as that long-awaited and celebrated king who is ruling over every 
aspect of our lives in truth and justice and righteousness with love and grace for all those who are His. Friend, if you've not ever turned to Christ as Lord, if you've never submitted your heart to Him as King, do so today. Find the abundant life that comes as you trust in Christ and the Holy Spirit of God is given and implanted into your soul. I pray that even right now, as you are hearing this, that God is illuminating the the eyes of your heart, that He's opening the ears of your heart to receive the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is King and He is returning for His kingdom He died for sins and was raised again so that you, dear friend, can have the hope of eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and eternity in the presence of God in Jesus Christ, your King. But that hope is not certain for those who do not know Him. So when Christ returns, those who are united to Him by faith will receive Him with rejoicing. But those, and you can be certain of this, who do not know Christ as King, when He returns, will receive Him with mourning with disdain, with anger, and with total hatred for finally putting to an end the kingdoms they have built for themselves. Dear friend, enter into the joy of the King. Trust Jesus with your life. Be certain Christ is returning. Third and finally this church, be cheerful. Be cheerful because Christ is returning. Be cheerful because Christ is returning. This is exceptionally good news for Christians. The fact that Jesus promised that he would return is is good news for us. It is news of, of hope and joy to we who are waiting for him. Jesus is returning even as he promised to complete our salvation, to usher us into the new heavens and the new earth, to consummate his kingdom and the redemptive work of God that began in Genesis 3 when God promised that the offspring of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That first word of hope of salvation that would come through God's chosen servant who would put to, the, who would put to an end the sting of sin and death. Be cheerful. When Christ returns, He is coming to return and to to begin the story that we have all been waiting for. When Christ returns, the story we've all been really waiting and hoping for to be told will finally begin. The great author C.S. Lewis, in his series of novels, The Chronicles of Narnia, in the final book of the series, The Last Battle, in the last paragraph of that book, he writes this. And as Aslan, that kingly lion who rules over all of Narnia, as Aslan spoke, he no longer seemed to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. For them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now, at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. William Shakespeare wrote in his play, The Tempest, he put into the mouth of the character Antonio these words, what's past is prologue. That that means that everything that has come up to the present moment, even as Lewis is writing in the the last battle in the Chronicles of Narnia, everything that has happened before, all the joys, all the triumphs, all the sadnesses and and, and all of the brokenness and all the wars and all the battles and all the lifetimes that have been lived are only the cover page and the title page to the great story that has not yet been told. This is the truth of what we understand about Christ's return. This is what brings us joy and hope and cheer, is that when Christ returns for the Christian, the true story, the real story, finally begins. All of our life, all of the tragedies that we've experienced, all of the joys that we've known, all of the people that we've loved, every experience that we have gone through in our several decades of life, if we're so blessed to live that long, all of that is just prologue. 
all of that is just the cover and the title page. It's just an introduction in setting the context for the glorious reality that is yet to come, eternal life in the presence of God our King. Be cheerful, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged. Be filled with joy. This life is only the beginning. It is only the prologue of the great story that will begin to be told in full when Christ Jesus returns to claim his bride. Jesus is a different kind of king, king over a global kingdom that, that, that finds its dominion in the hearts of all those who know him and love him, and he is certainly returning to perfect the salvation of those he died and rose again to purchase and who have placed their faith in him. Dear Christian, be ready. Christ is returning. Be confident, be certain, Christ is returning. And be cheerful, because Christ is returning. I'd like to close our time of uh, time spent in the Scriptures this morning by reading the final words of the final book of Scripture from Revelation chapter 22, verses 6 through 20. As there the Apostle John continues to relate and closes up the vision that he has had of the risen Lord Jesus and all that is going to take place before his coming. Listen to the words of Scripture. John writes, And he said to me, he's speaking here of uh, the angel that had appeared to him and revealed to him these many things. These, are the, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And now the words of Jesus, And behold... I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And Jesus, the risen Lord, said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my rep recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. John says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star, the, the promised Messiah. The Spirit, John says, the Holy Spirit and the bride, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, his people. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And the one who desires take the water of life without price. John says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He, Jesus, who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. It is our hopeful, joyous, cheerful expectation that Christ will return to complete our salvation, to bring all that we've been hoping and longing for in this life to its glorious conclusion and consummation, to usher we who know him by faith, who have submitted to him and, and worshiped him as king, to bring us into the new heavens and the new earth where we will dwell with him for all eternity. Dear Christian, be cheered in this fact. Dear friend, you who do not know Christ, I pray that you hear the hope that there is in trusting him as Savior and Lord. If you need to make a decision to follow Christ as Lord and Savior, do that today. In your own heart, in your own way, you can do that by confessing your sins to God realizing your need for a Savior and to be made right with Him, trusting Jesus as the Son of God, who died on the cross for your sins, was raised from the dead. Confess Him as Lord. Declare Him to be King over your life. Call upon Him as Savior. And the Bible says you will surely be saved.
let us know about that. Contact us this week. Send us an email. Call our church office. Uh, get in contact with us through our, our Facebook page. But let us know that you'd like to follow Jesus in faith and trust in Him so that we can come alongside you and help you to know how you can have assurance of your relationship with Christ and how you can begin growing as, as a lifelong and committed follower of Christ, a disciple who makes disciples. With all the hope we have in Christ's return, let's pray together. Gracious God, you are so good to give us this hope of salvation, this hope of Christ's return. Lord Jesus, we worship you as the King who has come into our hearts, who died for sins and was raised from the dead, who is glorified in flesh and who will return one day to call us to yourself. Until you do, Lord Jesus, may we be active kingdom servants in your absence, not busying ourselves with matters of minutia, but being busy about the mission that you have given to us to be your witnesses, to make disciples, teaching them to obey all that you have commanded us. And God, let us do this, Lord Jesus, let us do this with hope and confidence, knowing that you will soon return to bring all things to their right and proper conclusion and to receive your kingdom and its citizens who by faith have given their lives to you. Holy Spirit, help us to live in light of these wonderful truths. Help us to be ready. Help us to be certain. Help us to be cheerful as we await the return of our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. I eagerly await meeting with you again in person. Until then, be well. God bless you. Love you.